Um, good morning, everyone. Let me share a famous line by Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, strength doesn't come from winning. Your struggle develop your strength. When you go through hardship and decide not to surrender, that is strength. Hello, everyone. I, Dr. Anjana Kalunda, welcome each one of you on behalf of Pratiksha Academic Group. Today's topic is vestibular function test, why we do it. Speaker is Dr. Surajit Burman. He is ENT consultant at Nightingale Hospital. Moderator of the session is Dr. Anjana Sharma. I have the privilege to share her brief biodata. She has done her MBBS from Assam Medical College. Also, she has done DLO and MS from AMC Debrugger. Her area of interest is neuroautology. And she has a vast interest in or uh, experience in uh, uh, of 21 years, uh, practicing at her own clinic, that is uh, Max Care ENT Clinic at Sipsagar, Assam. Other than her educational expertise, she and her family blessed with music. And uh, she is a varutuso, that means uh, Italian word varutuso, an individual who possesses outstanding talent in field of music and art and playing musical instrument. She is a gifted violinist. Thank you, Anjana, for accepting our invitation. Over to you, Anjana. Uh, thank you, Anjana, Vaidu, for your introduction. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Pratiksa Academic Group uh, for being a, uh, for allowing me be to be a part of this uh, program, uh, as we all know that uh, maintaining of balance is a very complex mechanism. Yet, it uh, works through set principles. So, information about our body position uh, has been uh, uh, has been tra transferred to the brain through a uh, few sensors of our body, that is eyes, labyrinth, and proprioceptors of joints and muscles. And these informations are integrated in the brain and it correlates with the similar vestibular memory and, uh, and central nervous system will generate a precise motor response to the muscles of the joints, the muscles of the uh, trunk and the limbs for the maintaining of posture and also to the extraocular muscles for stabilization of the vision. So to get an acuity of vision, the image of interest has to fall in our uh, important part of the retina. It's a very small area that is phobia. So when we move our head to one side, our uh, the focus will go out of the phobia and there will be blurring of vision. So to overcome these uh, difficulties, God has given an uh, important reflex that is vestibular ocular reflex. So through this, once we move the head to other side, then our eyes will move to the opposite side. And this is the basis of vestibular ocular reflex. This is the one important test in vestibular function test. Other similar situation uh, arises where we uh, uh, way we might lose our balance is that when we look at uh, some uh, points in our uh, visual field and suddenly we have to move to the other point, then another system comes, that is the, our circuits. When we need to focus a particular moving object constantly, our uh, smooth process system will come. And then other two systems are the virgins and then uh, optokinetics. These are called ocular motor system, and these are also important part of our vestibular system. And cerebellum plays an important role in maintaining of balance because even the central nervous system that uh, cere uh, cerebrum will generate motor response to the effector organ like muscles of the trunk and limbs, or extracular muscles, but cerebellum will decide how much we uh, the muscle will contract for how long. 
So vestibular function phase will also tell about the condition of the cerebellum. So with these words, I just want to introduce our today's speaker, that is Dr. Surajit Barman. He has done his MBBS from Guwahati Medical College and masters from Assam Medical College, Tripurugar. And immediately after passing out, he has uh, developed interest in neuroautology. Uh, thanks for, uh, uh, thanks Gotomda, because uh, he told me once that Gotomda has insisted him to take up this subject. And for last 15 years, he is uh, attending a different neuroautology workshop uh, under the guidance of uh, the father of neurotology, that is uh, Professor Oliver Bessus. And I have seen him for last six, seven years being a faculty in different neurotology workshop in the entire world organized by our parent body, that is uh, NES, as well as uh, the Cyclops groups. So I can say he is the pioneer in popularizing uh, neurotology in Northeast. With these few words, over to uh, Surajit. You are muted. Uh, please unmute yourself, Surajit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vaidyo. Uh, those are great words coming from you. You have always been uh, someone I have looked up to. Like from my postgraduate days, when we used to hear about you in the Google Medical College, uh, professors, because we had just passed out a few years before. And they were Your voice is not good have great opinions about you. So, I uh, hope my voice is better now, sir. Yes, better. Yes, better. Yes. So, today, without much further ado, we'll go straight to uh, the topic, vestibular function test, why we do it. Now, uh, before talking about vestibular function test, there was a question put up to me by uh, Anjana Talukdar, by the way, not uh, Sharma. Anjana Talukdar, by the way, a few days ago, and uh, she said, she had asked me, why is it that some people say you have to do a VNG and some people say you have to do a vestibular function test? And what is, because you are doing the same thing, you are doing the same thing. And I said, by the what we are doing is a vestibular function test because when we talk about VNG, we are talking about video nystagmography. So basically, video nystagmography means we are recording the nystag, uh, the nystagmus elicited by different uh, ways. And we are reading or trying to diagnose it from that. But what we are doing here is much beyond simple uh, nystagma elicitation. There's a whole line of tests involved. So I'll just go into what are the tests involved. So before that, I'm going to show you. Uh, today I have taken the help of one of my uh, hospital colleague and uh, hospital worker, Mr. Rekhid. And uh, he has uh, kindly accepted to be the uh, guinea pig in this test. So here is the, uh, Mr. Rekid. As you can see, we have already installed the VNG glasses on him. And some few things I want to uh, make sure is number one, when you put in the glasses, this knob, this has to be very tight. Otherwise there's chance of the glass slipping. And once we put it in, then, we go for calibration. Now in uh, Rekid's case, we have already done the calibration, but you can see what I want to show you is the position of his eyes. Now both the eyes, be it the right or the left, be it the, so sorry. you can see the right and the left, the eyes are equidistant from the midline and they're at the same level. This is very important. Because if you do not put the eyes at the same level, the certain results may vary. Now, once the calibration has been done, we will now do the calibration. Rekid, it will decision on it will right, left, up, down, go to You will just move with it. To me, to put it, it will be to side. Now, we will do the calibration. As you can see, his eyes move with the white dot. So the calibration is okay. Why do we need to do, why do we need to calibrate? 
we need to calibrate because every person's range of eye motion is different. The software that comes with this machine has a in already an inbuilt uh, pre-calibrated uh, values, but it is always better to do the calibration because every individual eye movement is different. Now, once we've done the calibration, we come to the control panel. As you can see in the control panel, we have a number of tests. We have the stretches, the smooth pursuit, caloric, optokinetic test, the mystic mask, the gauge test, the positional test, the saccadic test, uh, then again the saccadic visual vertical, this was the saccadic uh, midpoint, then pupillometry is not done in VNG, it is more helpful in central, other central diseases, then we have the head impulse test, and we also have a uh, option of going for video frenzy. Now, today, I'm not going to talk about two very important things, the caloric and the head impulse. Why? Because I want to focus on why VNG is a misnomer and vestibular function test is the correct word for this test. Because as already mentioned, in the whole line of test, nystagmus was involved only in the caloric test and the nystagmus, the gaze gave or um, continuous nystagmus. Everywhere else, other tests, be the second, the smooth pursuit, the head impulse, everything else, other eye movement other than uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. was involved. So first let's do the test and then we'll discuss the different parameters. So first we'll do the second. Okay, it is in Pineda, So now as you can see in the monitor, the white dots move and the patient's eyes moves along with. Then there is this graph. The green is the movement of the white dot in the monitor. The red is the right eye. The blue is the left eye. We can do both horizontal circuit and vertical circuit. Here, now, the dot is moving up down and the eyes are moving along with. And so is the graph. Second to this, we have, so it is very important to let the patient know that while doing the test, the important thing is, yes, your eyes need to move with the white dot, but your head needs to be absolutely steady. So this is the smooth pursuit, again, horizontal smooth pursuit, as you can see, the white dot is moving along in a smooth curve and the eyes are following it and you can see the graph below. We'll do the same. The vertical smooth pursuit is a little difficult for many patients. Even normal patients sometimes tend to have irregularity in the vertical smooth pursuit and that is why isolated Discrepancy in the vertical smooth pursuit is sometimes not considered to be pathology. So, as already mentioned, we will not talk about the caloric today. We will straight away go to the optokinetic test. So, in the optokinetic test, we have this white and black grid in the uh, monitor and the patient is asked to look straight. Okay. Or sometimes what uh, is said is you imagine that this grid is a window. As if you're looking outside. So we start with left to right. You can see that the grid starts moving and Although I have asked the patient not to move his eyes, this movement that you see is completely involuntary. He doesn't know that his eyes are moving. So the red is the vertical, uh, the horizontal plane. The, it looks black here, it's more of a gray, is the vertical uh, segment. There's not much movement in the vertical segment, but there is huge movement in the horizontal segment of the eyes. And this is involuntary. This is not mystigma. This is optokinetic reflex. 
so we can do it in the other way also so you can see again then we have the vertical of the kinetic test also where the grid is moving from up to down and here now you see the red line which is horizontal is completely straight but the gray line which is responsible for the vertical segment is now moving around showing that you can do it the other way around also bottom to top Next, before coming to uh, nystagmus, we will have this gauge test. Again, you see that the white light is in the middle. And once we start the test, now with time, the white light will change, the white dot will change, and the eye moves along with it. Stays in one particular position for around a few seconds, goes back to midline, and then goes up or down. And the eyes change along with it. Positional test will not stop because we have already had a presentation on positional test a few, I think, last year. So we'll then go to subjective midpoint. Now, in subjective midpoint, what the patient sees is this, and then this long white line will start moving from left to right or right to left, and the patient has to tell when that line is in the midpoint. This can be done two ways. We can give a joystick to the patient, and he can move it and put it in the midline. But what I prefer is to move the line myself, and then. Ask the patient to tell me when it is in midline. If you have a lot of people who are in midline, you will be able to get a lot of people who are in midline. So, as you can see, to further give him his uh, vestibular system uh, further test, the background is always moving. Perfect. So as you can see, he has told me when it is in midline and it is almost perfect. We can also do this in a blank background. If the patient we find is having trouble with a moving background, we can even do this in a blank background. So we'll stop it. Then we have the subjective visual vertical. Here again, instead of the whole line moving from one side to another, the line is rotating and the patient has to tell it when this horizontal line becomes absolutely vertical. It does it a fidaho, tetiako. Okay. Yeah, perfect. This again can be done with a blank background too. Uh, this in brief are the tests that we are going to talk about today. So, so these in brief are the talk uh, are the normal tests. So we will now list break uh, it. So why am I not talking about video head impulse test and caloric test? Because in itself these two tests are so vast that to try
try to incorporate them in this small frame of science is difficult. Now, when we talk about this test, like we talked about second, and we saw the seconding graph. So this was the seconding graph of my test patient today. So what do you mean by second? So if I have to define what is second, then second is a quick simultaneous movement of both eyes between two or more phases of fixation in the same direction. Huh. What is its use? The use is to is for the orientation towards an object of interest. So basically what it means is suppose I am sitting here and I am looking at the monitor. Now as you can see I have two monitors here, two computer screens and one monitor. Now I need to shift my focus. Sometimes I need to look at this because I want to see which way it is moving. Sometimes I need to look at my patient and sometimes I need to look at my computer screen. But I am fixed and seated in front of the uh, in a particular position. So when I am looking at here, then I suddenly move my vision here, then here. So this is not a thing. We're just jumping from one point to the other. This and then back again. Or I will be jumping from one point, second point, third point, back again. This movement, when the head is fixed and I'm only doing it with my eyes, is a second. Now the seconds are mainly controlled by uh, centrally. The voluntary seconds are controlled by the uh, frontal IC and the involuntary uh, seconds are controlled by superior colliculus of mid brain. Involuntary uh, seconds means I'm looking at this monitor and suddenly something happens in the right side of my eye. The patient is a fly length of the patient and the patient is jumping around and I suddenly move that side. So that is the problem. Uh, so, Rajit, can you remove your mask and talk? Because uh, Fukan Shah is telling that he, your voice is not audible, but we are getting it's okay. But can you can you remove your mask? I saw what Fukan Shah just said. Uh, sir, if everybody else is getting the voice and it's only you are not getting them, I, it, the problem may be in your side also. So, are ev everybody having problem with the voice? Or is it only Fukan Shah? Rajit, your voice. Rajit. Can I say your voice is definitely very low because you are having your mask and probably your microphone is slightly away. So you okay. can hear, but it is a bit low, definitely. You're, you have a big voice. Okay, you but uh, you can understand everything, sir? Yes, yes, we can. But it will be comfortable to have a slightly louder sound. Okay, okay. Then I'll uh, remove my mask. Give me a second. Now I'm using the earphone. I think it will be better. Yes. Yes, it's coming nice. How is it now? Yeah, my ear. I'm using earphone now. It will be okay. 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 Uh, so we are talking about the second. So as you can see, the control of the second is in the central. It's, so any problem in the second will be of central origin. So this second that I uh, showed here of my test subject appears to be very normal. So we'll try to localize a second which is abnormal. So yesterday I went through all my uh, things and I have located one second which I'm going to show you. So as you can see in this second, there are irregularities. Now, I will not be talking about what these irregularities are. Anjana Vaidyo will, um, Anjana Sharma Vaidyo will know. But I think uh, at this moment, if we go too deep into this subject, it will not be right. So this is a patient with irregular saccades. And you can see the smooth pursuit also very irregular in this patient. You can also see the eye movement of this uh, patient. I'll show you.
Now this, this is the optokinetic. I will show you the smooth pursuit. So the, as you can see, the patient was not smoothly following uh, the white light. The eyes, if you can remember, you can see it is jumping around and the eye is moving around. So this is a irregular smooth pursuit. Even the saccades in this patient, the videos of the saccades, again, the patient was jumping around. Next, we come to the uh, smooth pursuit. Now, again, I'll show my patient smooth. Sorry, I jumped up to the optokinetic, the smooth pursuit. As you can see, this was the smooth pursuit graph. I'll show you the video of his uh, smooth pursuit. No, I end up always opening the video. So as you can see, this was such nice follow-up. So the smooth pursuit is the movement of the eye tracking a moving uh, object. So as if I if I'm looking straight and I see a bird fly, and with my head fixed, if I go on looking at the bird as it flies around, that is smooth pursuit. So smooth pursuit is uh, the control of smooth pursuit is very complex because the eye movement, the vestibular part, everything is involved. The lateral geniculate uh, nucleus and the primary visual cortex is involved. There's involvement of the frontal cortex, superior calliculus, the pontine nucleus, like the dorsolateral uh, pontine nucleus and nucleus reticulus, uh, tegmenti pontis, and the vestibular cerebellum all are involved in the smooth pursuit. So basically, the saccades and the smooth pursuit gives us an idea about the oculomotor pathway, and any disturbance in this points towards the central pathology. So uh, any patient who has irregularity in the saccades or in the smooth pursuit can be uh, considered to have a central uh, vestibular lesion. The next we talk about is of optokinetic test. Now, optokinetic test, what is optokinetic test? It is a combination of slow phase movement. Sorry, I slipped my, my mobile. So optokinetic is a combination of uh, slow phase track, uh, slow phase and fast phase eye movement. As you can see, this on the graph looks very much like a nystagma. Actually, uh, in some of my presentations where I have to show a normal nystagma, I sometimes show the video of a optokinetic test. I'll show you the video of this uh, test only if I show you the only the video without showing the graph. Can you see? It looks exactly like a nystagma. Now, optokinetic test is to track a moving object. It's something similar to a smooth person. Here, however, the head is completely fixed, and this object that I'm tracking once it moves out of the visual field, the eye suddenly has to jump back to its neutral position. Again, the control of optokinetic is from the cortex, brainstem, and cerebellum. So any discrepancy in the optokinetic again signifies a central pathway. Next, we come to the other tests that we did. We did the subjective midpoint, we did the subjective visual vertical, all these are again signifies a central pathology. Now, if you'll give me one, uh, five more seconds, we'll come back to nystagma. Uh, five more minutes. Now, what is nystagma? Nystagma, if I need to define, is the involuntary rhythmic side to side up and down or circular motion of the eye with a definite slow phase and fast phase. And it can be 
present uh, spontaneously or physiologically it can be induced by either um, giving some cognitive stimulation some eye visual stimulation or even some uh, vestibular stimulation and the reason for uh, nystagmus uh, involvement is mostly peripheral but certain central causes of nystagmus are also there we'll talk into that so uh, just give me one minute and i'll demonstrate how to look for the segments now today we will only talk about nystagmus spontaneous nystagmus will not about talk about the evoked nystagmus much because evoked nystagmus in a normal person is not physiological we cannot be invoked we have to do a caloric and as already mentioned we will talk about caloric on a later day now this is i am i am trying to elicit continuous uh, see if there is any spontaneous nystagmus the person's eye is not in the same level so now it's relatively so what i have asked the patient to do is as you can see he is here again and he is looking straight at this point so his eyes is fixed at the center and then i just start the graph so as you can see we can see his eye and this is the graph and we can see the horizontal movement the right horizontal right vertical the right or left horizontal left vertical and there is no movement there is no nystagmus then what we do is stop this and then we remove the fixation so we ask him to see this do this we do the same thing in darkness so now i completely cover his eyes as you can see he is in complete darkness so we give up poha dekhisan again he is in complete darkness but the advantage of a infrared camera is you can still see his eyes very well and then we start so even in darkness there is no nystagmus he has no nystagmus stop the next is high frequency head trick where we now can see take the head of the patient in a very high frequency for around 30 40 beats usually this results in the glass getting a little off center so even now he has no nystagmus if you see the graph when i did the head movement there is lot of eye movement involved but now it's all better one problem is his eye focus was moving around so if we correct that now the eye focus the uh, the sense is centered and his graph is now absolutely not so these are some of the ways artifacts come so when we see this kind of a thing instead of thinking of some these are thing we have to find out whether the eye focus is on center as you can see it is moving around then other types of uh, induced uh, we try to induce nystagmus by hyperventilation valsalva etc so we'll talk about all those so this is now i'll stop just a moment i'll relieve my eye of all this first this is now it's very really it jumped around so now let's see now uh, some nystagmus so we want to see first a torsional nystagmus
this is a patient of uh, BPPB. So I had done her uh, deep thal pipe. Can you see the nystagmus, the torsional nystagmus in this patient? Now, I'll again restart it. Now, on the face of it, this may look like a horizontal nystagmus. You need to focus on the patient. Uh, I've always said if you want to look at whether the nystagmus is torsional or simply horizontal, don't look at the pupil. Look at the congested blood vessel. Because the pupil is circular, it is always difficult to see if there is very little torsional movement, if the vertical movement is low. So the, uh, the congested blood vessels give a better option. Then let's try to see a uh, uh, nystagmus on head shaking and gaze uh, involved nystagmus. If I can find one, yes. This is continuous to life. As you can see, here is a very minimal. Now, what happens is in this patient, if you see directly, you may not elicit the nystagmus on vision. This patient, if you see clinically, you may not actually see nystagmus in him. But if we go to his graph and see, this is his spontaneous to light. And we see very small, tiny nystagmus bits coming along sometimes. But when we go to the darkness, when his fixation is removed, now you see. When his fixation is removed, can you see the nystagmus beat? I will show his video. Nystagmus uh, in dark. What happens is this mistake must you can see he has very little. So these are so uh, minimal that sometimes just by looking at it, it clinically we may not be able to see that. But in the graph you saw how pronounced it was. Even in high frequency head shake, I'll show his video. So he is looking straight. Now I'll move his head. You can see this is when I move the head in high frequency head shake. Stop it. And you can see the nystagmus with coming in. Again, this may not be very pronounced if you look at the video, but if you look at his graph, see, this is the head movement, and immediately post head movement, can you see? how pronounced this nystagmus was. So this is why so this is why we need to do a vestibular function test beyond caloric and even beyond head impulse. One, because lot of other parameters are involved other than simply nystagma. So to call it only video nystagmography will be very wrong. It is vestibular function test because we are not only looking at the nystagma, we are looking at the second, the smooth pursuits, the optokinetic, and all those. And number two, why you need to record it is just now I showed you in the last video, his clinically his nystagma was not very easily visualized. But when you look at the graph, they are so pronounced nystagmus. This patient had come with a vertigo history of only 10 days. So it was diagnosed as an acute unilateral vestibulopathy, which previously was known as vestibular neuritis. We had started him on uh, high dose uh, oral therapy. 
and when he came for checkup in three weeks time, his uh, rotator vertigo was completely gone. But uh, what happened was his uh, sense of imbalance was still there. We had put him on vestibular uh, exercises, and he's much better. I can see a comment from uh, Fukun sir. He wants me to explain subjective visual vertical uh, and all those. So, sir, to explain uh, subjective visual vertical and all, I would prefer to go through the bucket test and all those things. And uh, because those gives a better uh, understanding of the visual vertical thing than actually here. Because to properly test the subjective visual vertical, the patient needs to be in a completely dark environment where his sole focus is on the moving uh, line. Unfortunately, in a test like this, that is not possible. And his peripheral vision needs to be completely stopped. And in a situation like this, that cannot be done. So honestly, for subjective visual vertical, I prefer a bucket test or a completely uh, dark room. Again, in in a completely dark room, how do I test him? I will not be able to see the keyboard. So with these things, instead of going into a lot of details, I will stop my presentation here today uh, because it's uh, uh, just 10 minutes to 10. So we need to maybe discuss a few more points also. With this, I uh, hand over the mic to Anjana Sharma, ma'am, uh, for any further discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Surajit, for your wonderful uh, demonstration. So I request uh, the members who are present here, to, if you have any queries, you can type it here or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself. And if you have any query, you can ask Surajit directly. Surajit? For BFT, any uh, this one, empty stomach or full stomach, physical no. stomach? No. Uh, for vestibular function, test, the only thing that is necessary is that the patient does not uh, take any kind of sedative agent in the last 48 hours. So it may be a vestibular sedative like an anti-vertigo drug. I prefer them not taking it for 48 hours. It can be an antihistaminic, which can cause a sleepiness. It can be a sleeping tablet. It can be alcohol. Any of Anything that can uh, sedate the vestibular organ. Because then we may get a hypoactive response because of the drugs and not because of the disease. As far as empty stomach, before when we used to do a lot of caloric, I used to ask the patient to come with at least three hours of empty stomach because when you do caloric, the dizziness sometimes induces vomiting. But after the advent of uh, video head impulse test, the amount of caloric being done has gone down drastically. So that has also, that advice has also come down. Surajit, uh, while uh, treating a case of uh, vestibular disorders, uh, so how often you put the VNG goggles? Uh, Which before, other cases will uh, definitely put the VNG goggles to check? Means vestibular function test using the VNG goggles. Okay, so uh, I'll go through how I go about in a vestibular patient. So. Uh, a patient who comes to me with vertigo will have the, take, the history will be taken and then I go for the test. Apart from the general test, I will do a positional test in the patient. Now, while doing a positional test, two things may occur. One, I may immediately get a good positive finding and do the requisite uh, repositioning maneuvers and finish it off. In those patients, I may need, may need not go for a goggle. But in many patients, what I see is even on doing a positional test, I may not elicit the stigma, but the patient is telling me, giving me a history very typical of a positional vertigo, be it uh, posterior, be it lateral. Anterior, I have, I think, in my life got only one. So, in those patients, I would love to put them on a BNG gun. Because, as I already mentioned, sometimes nystagmus, which are clinically so insignificant or so, so difficult to catch, can easily be elicited. Uh, seen on the VNG goggles. Secondly, any patient where I have doubt of my diagnosis, I'll put in the VNG goggles. And thirdly, nowadays, even patients where the diagnosis may be very well understood, 
sometimes need to put under vng uh, because of different other reasons the patient wants a test for medical legal reasons whatever i do a lot of uh, patient not patient lot of normal vng lot of normal people because they send they are sent to me by construction companies and all because they will be climbing high towers and they need to know that their vestibular system is okay before climbing towers so around 5 10 of those cases every month i do so in short any person with vertigo if under unless it is a very acute case the patient is unable to walk i would prefer putting that patient under a bng gamma anything um, ma'am you would like to add or somebody you would like to add yeah, many a times actually uh... A positional listing must may not be due to you know uh, BPPV, so it may be a case of vestibular migraine or it may be a case of cerebellar uh, cerebellar lesion. So in that case, eliciting typical listing must uh, if you won't be able to elicit it, particular listing must meant for particular semicircular canal. Then we should think of what else it could be. So we should think about it may be a case of vestibular migraine. or it may be a case of a cerebellar lesion so uh, that vng will tell you exactly what kind of nystagmus it is if you are getting a down beating nystagmus on positional uh, and if it is present in the spontaneous after removal of the fixation as well that indicates that it is not due to the stimulation of the semicircular canal it may be due to the vestibular migraine as well as cerebellar dysfunction so that's <laughs> yeah so yes it is yeah. but you are experienced enough so uh, i am not that much so i use, always put a gurgles while doing position and maneuver because many a time uh, we might miss that spontaneous listing mass uh, so that will uh, give a confusion whether i am uh, getting a bppv or something else so uh, it is very good for the beginners to have a use uh, gurgles ideally every patient who comes to you for vertigo even when i do the positional test in my clinic ideally it's always better to put the vng gamma in my case what happens is my opd chamber and my vng vertigo clinic is in two different floors so it's not possible for me to put the gamma yes yes what you yes, are so one thing i want to ask surajit yes. uh, particularly when you do a tics and hall pack and it is subjective pppv and uh, you cannot detect the nystagmus i think the your infrared camera is better option yes sir so minor and another the thing patient is giving that history but i am not seeing uh, yeah there is got subjective subjective uh, and if it is objective then no problem and another thing is for whether i think the hng glass will detect uh, the, when you are, you are succeeded to get the autoconia back to the utricle I think that by the moment of the eyes, is there any option? Long. Uh, we can uh, record the movement of the eyes. The eye movement can tell us, but what happens is uh, there is no specific VNG features which will point that. The VNG is just looking at the eye and giving us the eye movement. So as we do, uh, at least if we put the goggles. and we go into the different positions as you can uh, know when yes. you do at least each position and um, uh, means that the autoconia is moving in a particular direction so it's always helpful what happens is sometimes we see change from one position to the other very fast instead of the autoconia going into the right direction it can actually come back and in that situation the nystagma uh, plane will change so to do a uh, at least with uh, the nystagmus glass on is actually very helpful because we can actually look whether the autoconia is moving in the plane we want to however uh, what happens is in uh, at least the movement is almost a the patient is lying down head is it's almost a 270 degree movement and then come back with the glasses sometimes what happens is the glass moves around so we may get a little difficulty but with experience this is technically a very good thing to do now in final position that is lifting a uh, last last position ha huh, yes. tilting the head uh, i think at that time is is there an indication we get by your vng glass uh, that you, i am success that successful in putting the autoconia in the right direction 
Sir, the VNG glasses will show the eye movement. That is one thing that correct. most of us do not see the eye movement because we are pushing it up. So we see the eye movement. And if the autoconia has moved out of the semicircular canal, then the eye movement, the nystagma plane suddenly changes. And that change can be a Yes, yes uh, Suraj is it absolutely right. In each phase of AP's maneuver, will uh, the nystagmus pattern will be changed. So, so that can give you an idea where the autolysis is going, whether it has been corrected or not. And we'll will again we'll we'll do a review after three days or seven days whether patient is getting relief or not. We can check it again, uh, but it is I don't uh, know, advise to do it immediately. Immediately, uh, the uh, please will check it after three or seven days. I prefer three days, by the way. Yes. In your another thing, one question I to ask: Have you seen with this VNG glass? There's Simmons Plus, uh, like Michael Stroop, they telling about more bending. I haven't done, I haven't done Simon. I haven't actually done any uh, repositioning exercise in the VNG glass. I have done lot of uh, positional tests. It, uh, be it the eye movement, everything, but I haven't done any uh, repositioning exercises, be it Simmons, be it athletes, be it uh, barbecue roll with the VNG glass on. Uh, because honestly, sir, I find it a little cumbersome with the glass cumbersome. to move around. For you, I think it will be easy, but for us, it is <laughs> we cannot do because uh, the difficult it is. Uh, so, very much confused and as. Always only one business is cumbersome, cumbersome like that. <laughs> it's always difficult. And I one thing, another question I want to ask you. Uh, suppose I have the, the uh, suffered BBV thrice. Still sometimes rising from the base, I feel something wrong. Is the some calcium carbonate particle is still moving in your in my kennel? Is it, sir, uh, see, sir. If you go to the pathophysiology of BPV, yes. Yes, yes. the calcium system that is in the uh, semicircular canal, even if you do not do anything to it, after a certain time, it, yes, should, it, goes dissolve. Up. it should dissolve. So, yeah. a long standing positional vertigo mainly points towards the central positional vertigo. No, and no. Uh, some autoconia it, moving in the canal and they conglomerate to make a, a, a vertigo. If I have got 10 of 10, 20 calcium carbonate moving in my uh, canal, in canal, if, suppose four are getting conglomerated, it may cause something may be feel, not the giddy, my feeling may also, uh, yes. that your, I may feel, it definitely. may occur over. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Yes, it's explained by someone long back. And another is, yesterday yes. I asked you a question about Hannibal's sign. Is it helpful in my, uh, this your uh, Meniere's disease? But they are not helpful. There are some uh, which uh, uh, Jana has told that no, I am not ready. But is it helpful? Uh, because both of you are auto neurologists, because therefore I am asking this. Question. Sir, I have no comments on that, sir. On the other you'd like to add anything? No, I I have never done it, and, and I don't have any experience whether. No, because it is a it is a no practical third window, no the can can but still. Yes, the secure is must enlarge and putting the foot plate with the tulio phenomenon occurs. There is the occurring tulio phenomenon with the intact third window. Uh, like they explain like that. Yeah, I don't know. You maybe experienced more than I'm asking the question. Uh, sir, I haven't yet. This was in Michael Strobe edited, very recent one who a small bullet in air. Hey, what has given me? Because uh, we, therefore I have gone through that then night. There I got that one. Therefore, I'm asking you. Level, level, but now. thank you very much. Good demonstration. But these things, I think you should always give within a very short and short time because people will know what is the utility of this, actually, practically. Actually, practically. Because if they do not know what I'm doing, why I'm just, why I'm doing the this and this, this and this, this and this. But I still, I think, but I go with all this connection of the various system. As Anjana said that, <laughs> the ocular motor and everything the, from the vestibule connection is okay. still conflicting. Uh, the idea of doing this live actually came about two, two days back. Before that, I was actually planning a presentation, normal presentation. And then I realized to do a normal presentation and to talk about all this in a 
to the dimensional way in a normal powerpoint presentation is just is that i was not understanding what i was trying to say no in first part due to your voice i could not uh, get through uh, yes. the way i am using your phone now it is very clear uh, yes. but uh, i don't know why but still i sometimes thought that my hearing is discrimination is very low or but, but hearing is okay i think mark is clear sir mot ase pani uthai lolo mark ene ke pori asil no sir na first part like therefore something some part i 10 minutes i could not follow nothing therefore i think i am lagging some part still nice i think sir. it will be good next time oh i think lahile sir ami apuri thank you good na it could have but you can put in another about group of the practical thing what the vng gives on uh they you can so again a good presentation not yeah. giving lectures much but i think this is very good idea thank you very much so uh, there is no questions uh, in the chat box so uh, can i share something surojit i have told you about yeah, that how important yeah. it is yeah so that's what actually i thought this should be shared by in the physician platform not in the ent forum still i just wanted to share because how vng is helping me that this patient has come to me uh, uh few days back with uh, uh, acute vertigo seen by many many people Uh, he he was taking lot of uh, anti vertigo does in combination not getting relief of his uh, the vertigo so um, so uh, the looking at the patients uh, i thought it might be a central cause so i put the vng goggles i was not that expert like surojit to elicit head impulse test so i put the goggles i could see that no precision is uh, this is the sockets the precision is so less and we can uh, this is hypometric sockets hypometric sockets that means that the uh cerebellum is at fault so i did uh, the vertical sockets also same problem i'll show you the video of uh, the sec horizontal sockets you can see that how much it is problematic he is not uh, sockets is uh, this is abnormal sockets it is not precise he is not being able to reach in one target so there is also co uh, corrective sockets so the vertical sockets also same problem so uh, i thought of something is wrong with the cerebellum so i did uh, the clinical examination again see the patient was not being able to he is not he is not being able to uh, do alternate uh, the cerebellar test so uh, he failed to do so next day again i uh, did you can appreciate the problem on the right hand he is okay on the see that he is having hypotonia even finger nose test is also defective not being able to do finger nose to is on the left side that indicates that something is wrong with the left cerebellum so this is the M mri showing that uh, there is a lesion in the cerebellum so uh, this is a case of cerebellar tumor extend uh, cerebellar tumor and they are suspecting of nhl so so it is very you uh, know we have to be very cautious about dealing with acute vertigo hope we are not dealing a case of central vertigo that's what actually i wanted to share uh, so over to surajit very nice anjana very nice case you have demonstrated <clears throat> uh so we don't have any queries uh, so 
So we can conclude here. Uh, we go can the, yeah, yeah, we can go to answer, opinion, sir. Uh, Anjana? Uh, yeah, go to the, uh, please. Say your sound is low. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Anjana Vaidu. Okay. Um, I think it's time to conclude. So I formally thank Dr. Anjana for your expert moderation of the session. And thank you, Surajit, for your lucid in the demonstration on B uh, BFT. And I'm sure by this uh, live demonstration, we all are clear about the BFT. And special thanks to Dr. S.B. Phupan, sir, for our no, constant no. Uh, encouragement. And thank, uh, thanks to Dr. Gautam Khan, sir, and esteemed guests and my colleagues. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anjana. Very nice. Thank you, thank you Baido. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye. Both Anjana are active. Jeff, it is successful. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.